So in my last two videos on my channel, I've been talking about some of the changes in Amendment 2 of the 18th edition. And since then, I've received a couple of questions with regards to bonding in outbuildings and sheds. And this is something where there's been a slight change in um, Amendment 2 of the 18th edition. So I'm gonna talk about that in this video. So first of all, just to talk a little bit about what the concern is when it comes to sheds and outbuildings. So if a shed or an outbuilding has any extraneous conductive parts, so that could be a metallic water pipe that comes out of the ground, it could be um, metal work of the building itself, it could be structural steel, the metal frame of the shed. Sometimes you see sheds that are completely made of metal. Those are extraneous con conductive parts and they have to be bonded. And if you look at regulation 411.3.1.2 in the new regs book, uh, that's regarding protective equipotential bonding, it says, in each consumer's installation within a building, extraneous conductive parts liable to introduce a dangerous potential difference shall be connected to the main earthing terminal by protective bonding conductors complying with chapter 54. Examples of extraneous conductive parts may include metallic water pipes, metallic gas pipes, other metallic insulation pipework and ducting, central heating and air conditioning, and exposed metallic structural parts of the building. And then it goes on to say, where an installation serves more than one building, the above requirement shall be applied to each building. So basically, if you've got a house and then you've got a shed outside and that shed has extraneous conductive parts, then the same requirement applies to that. Now, when it comes to sizing the conductors, we have to turn to chapter 54. Regulation 544.1.1 explains how to size the bonding conductors. And it says, except where PME conditions apply, a main protective bonding conductor shall have a cross-sectional area not less than half the cross-sectional area required for the earthing conductor for the insulation. Where an insulation serves more than one building, a main protective bonding conductor shall be selected in accordance with the characteristics of the distribution circuit protective conductor for that particular building. The cross-sectional area shall not be less than six mil and need not exceed 25 mil. Now that is a change that's happened in Amendment 2 of the 18th edition. And the key word there is except where PME conditions apply. So PME is different, I'll come to that in a minute. So if you've got a TNS system, when you run your supply out to your building, now obviously you've got to size that in accordance with current carrier capacity, bulk drop, um, the adiabatic equation, and compliance with the maximum disconnection time. And obviously that depends on what you want to use the circuit for. Uh, so you obviously you'll need to assess the load. But what this means is, is that you can size the bonding conductor in accordance with the size of the CPC for that circuit, but it must not be less than six mil. So that might make a big difference when you're running a supply out to an outbuilding. If all you want to do is supply a socket and a light, for example, um, so that you can plug in a lawnmower or whatever, then you don't need to install a much larger bonding conductor than, than is necessary. The difference is, is when you've got a PME system. So when you've got a PME system, we select the size of the conductor in accordance with table 54.8. And the minimum size there, that's for 35 mil uh, pen conductors or less, is 10 mil. So in that situation where you've got a PME earthing system, obviously you're gonna to need to run a larger cable than what, you, than what you would have to do if you had a TNS or a TT system. So really important to understand the difference between the size of the bonding conductors for different types of earthing system. Generally, when we've got a TNS system, we select the size of bonding conductors in accordance with table 54.7. And in a PME system, it's table 54.8. Now, one caveat I'll add to that, though, is that there are some situations where you can have what looks like a traditional TNS system, but PME conditions still can apply because of alterations in the DNO's network. So one tip that I give to everybody is dial 105 from your mobile phone and check with your local DNO as to what the, what the earthing system should be. Um, and if they confirm that it's TNS, then I think it's safe to go ahead and, and follow the guidance here. But if it's a PME or if it could be a PME, then obviously we need to be careful and we need to size in accordance with table 54.8. Now, as I say, there are other considerations when you're running a supply to a shed or an outbuilding. Obviously, we need to select it in accordance with the uh, current can capacity, volt drop and so on. But also the circuit needs to comply with the wiring regulations. And so what we need to do, typically we need to install an armor cable and we need to install that in accordance with the wiring regulations. And one tip that I can give you today is that in the IET's guidance note seven, which I've got a copy of here. So guidance note seven for special locations. Now, this relates to 
special locations in chapter seven of the regs book. And it talks in detail about all the different special locations. The one thing that I've noticed is that there is a chapter called Gardens other than horticultural installations. Now, gardens is not listed in chapter seven in the Briggs book. However, the IEC have included a chapter on gardens in guidance note seven for special locations. And this is a really useful book. I'd recommend it to anybody in the industry. It talks specifically about the risks where we're in gardens and the risks are contact of persons with a general mass of earth, um, frequently wet environment, wearing of minimal clothing, gardening activity, um, insertion of spikes in the ground for securing marquees or inflatables, um, that sort of thing. It talks about the risks in gardens and it talks about buried cables and it talks specifically about the best way to install cables in a garden. So this is a really good book. Um, one thing that I would say though is that the new version of the book that's updated to Amendment 2 isn't available yet. I don't think the guidance notes usually follow on a few months later, so you may want to wait um, until the new version is out. But this is a really good book that I would recommend to everybody. And so it talks about things like cables exposed to sunlight, cables taken overhead, uh, socket outlets, um, it talks about ponds, and then we get on to um, section 13.7, which relates to supplies to outbuildings within the garden. And it talks in specific detail about the best way to do this. So I'd recommend this book to everybody. And another thing that it talks about is it talks about another option when you've got an outbuilding or a garden shed. It talks about the possibility of making it a TT system. Now this is another option where you've got a PME is that you could make the installation at the shed a TT system. So there's a number of considerations to take into account if you wanted to follow this method, if you wanted to make the installation at the shed a TT system. First of all, obviously, you're gonna to have to install an earth rod at the shed, which means checking for underground services. So that's a, a really important thing to check for. And I think there's some guidance on the HSE website. So if you did an internet search for um, checking for underground services, I'm pretty sure that there's some guidance on the HSE website that will help you with that. So that's just one thing. But also what we've got to make sure is that the install Insulation at the shed is completely separated from the earthing system in the house or, or in the property. So if you imagine if you run um, an armoured cable out to the shed, you would need to earth the armouring of the cable because that is an exposed conductive part. So what you would do is you would earth that at the supply end by making off the armoured and connected it to the earth. So when we get to the shed or the outbuilding, we need to completely disconnect the armoring of the cable and not connect that to the, the distribution board so that there's no connection between the between the PME earth and the TT earthing system at the shed. So this is a very important thing to bear in mind. It talks about this in some detail in this book and I really recommend this to, to anybody. It also goes on to talk about supply to hot tubs um, and yeah, re really, really useful book. So I'd recommend it to anybody, um, but just do bear in mind that there will be a new version coming out, obviously, that will be updated to amendment two. Now, a lot of the concerns around uh, supplies to outbuildings are because of uh, PME systems and because of what can happen with PME systems if there is a fault on the supplier's neutral. So because the supplier's neutral and earth are combined, if there was a loss of neutral, what that can mean is that that can mean that metal work connected to the supplier's MET can become live. So this is why there's particular bonding requirements when it comes to PME systems. Now there are a number of types of installations where we're not allowed to use PME at all. And I talk about that in another video on my channel. And if you'd like to see that, I'll put a link at the top of the screen.